morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of IFTA. I hope day one was enriching for each one of you all. Uh, I personally enjoyed all the panel discussions and the demos. I thoroughly cherish them. Day two is going to be equally interesting, I promise you. We shall first and foremost begin with this panel discussion, MSME lending. How has the story changed pre and post COVID? This panel is supported by Happy, a digital lending fintech targeting a multi-million dollar credit opportunity in India's micro business. Our moderator for this discussion is going to be Mr. Pran Bihanga Borpuzari, Associate Editor, ET Rise. Good morning, Mr. Pran. Trust you're doing well. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Yes. Our speakers are going to be Mr. Manish Khera, Founder and CEO, Happy. Morning, sir. We also have with us Mr. Ganesh Rengaswamy, Managing Partner, Kuona Capital. Trust you're doing well, Mr. Ganesh. Yes, thanks, Ms. Khan. Thanks for having me. We have with us Mr. Anup Kumar Agarwal, South Asia FinTech Lead, IFC. Morning, sir. Hi, thanks for having me. Pleasure is all ours. Joining them, Mr. Naveen Chandani, Managing Director and CEO, CRIF Haima Credit Information Services, Private Limited. Morning, Mr. Chandani. Hi. And we also have with us Mr. Sangram Singh, Executive Vice President and Head, Commercial Banking Group, Axis Bank. Good Hi, morning. good morning. All right. It's all over to you, Mr. Abhorpa Zarina. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Scott. And uh, it's great to have all of you here. Uh, I think uh, I should start with uh, Sangram first, since he's the only banker in the panel. Uh, I think everyone's interested in what banks are doing. Uh, so my first question to you would be, how have things changed between, you know, what you guys uh, did at the bank before the pandemic and uh, what has happened now? Are you guys lending more, lending less? What are you guys doing? So I think uh, what's happening is also a reflection of, you know, how our customers are looking at credit right now and what kind of need are they seeing? So obviously the first couple of months were quite brutal, right? Uh, and there was a reduction in uh, demand for the customer's business and hence that cascaded into the kind of lines that they were looking for, what working capital they were requiring at that point in time. Um, and of course, during that entire thing, there were interventions uh, by RBI, by the government and by banks in terms of providing moratorium in providing uh, emergency credit lines, et cetera, which were more to sort of uh, helped the businesses uh, cope with what was happening. Off late, however, what we are seeing is that businesses are largely coming back on track. Uh, volumes in some of the businesses have reached pre-COVID level or exceeded pre-COVID level. Of course, there are some which are impacted, right? And especially the ones which had face-to-face uh, -face consumer dealings. So whether those were related to some part of real estate or uh, similar businesses which got more impacted, some others were, have been less impacted. Now, as this goes through, what we are trying to do is work with our customers to understand uh, what the working capital needs evolve into now, right? And in some cases, the cycles have shrunk, some cases cycles have lengthened. Uh, how does the new working capital requirement, uh, how is that gonna be met? Are some businesses are deleveraging and some require a little more capital? So I think all banks are working uh, with their clients to sort of fix that. Uh, at the same time, those uh, initial uh, moratorium uh, interventions, as well as then the emergency credit line, has helped a lot of business, you know, provide some additional liquidity, uh, has helped the banks being able to provide that additional liquidity to the clients. So I think it's, people are still waiting for, to see how things are going to evolve. Uh, because those who have uh, those businesses that have come out want to see a continued increase in cash flow, um, and those who still are getting stressed, we, we everyone needs to watch out to see how long. I mean, how long will that stress last, and finally, what shape and uh, form it will take. So, I I think if you look at you know what banks have been doing, whether in pure lending or in the emergency credit lines, you'll find that I think the lending tabs have been opened uh, for a while now. So there is more and more um, flow which is going on at this point in time. Uh, but what, what is going to be interesting to see is how in, let's say, about two quarters from now, um, how will the demand have changed? Uh, and which segments will be asking for more credit and which ones will be asking for less credit now? All right. Uh, Manish, we can come to you. 
at the other end of the spectrum of uh, SMEs is the M part of it. And, uh, you know, they are about 99% of the segment in terms of volume. How much of credit and benefits is actually flowing to this community, you know, the government policies and everything else that's been announced? Uh, what's happening there? So, um, uh, thanks for having us here. Uh, uh, great to be among uh, so many um, uh, people working in the sector. Uh, at this level, in my experience, in the last uh, six months, what we have seen, uh, the uh, our policy intervention has been quite mixed. Uh, or the um, uh, uh, what we have been trying to do as an ecosystem, I think, has been quite mixed. Um, the the benefits that we have thought through, uh, we have thought through more from I would say the higher end of the MSME, uh, the segment that we work in, which is say micro, which is literally a proprietor running a business, and at some levels uh, more than business, I would want to say we should think of it as a livelihood. So that livelihood had a disruption. Uh, whichever programs that we have thought through. Um, uh, whether that was our TLTROs or that was the ECLGs, they were all designed for an organized setup, not for the unorganized setup. We went all the way down and did uh, uh, think of something called as a, those vendor loans, uh, but that went even far lower than the M segment that one typically talks about a typical restaurant, a neighborhood restaurant, a typical neighborhood shopkeeper, a typical neighborhood saloon shop and all. So as an ecosystem, including, I would say, the financial ecosystem. So while, uh, you know, Sangam is right, uh, credit is now flowing, but it's flowing top down. So from larger organizations, larger banks to larger NBFCs to smaller NBFCs, the trickle still has to reach the micro customer. Uh, we never went and analyzed um, their, uh, you know, like, uh, that whole ECLG program where we were trying to give that six month requirement to businesses uh, and NBFCs for them to be able to meet their liquidity requirement. We never met that requirement for that micro business. Uh, but fortunately, and as usual, uh, outside of this as well, because our formal system as yet has not touched them for years, uh, they found their equilibrium among themselves. Uh, the typical customer that we service employs five people. Uh, their biggest cost is their uh, premises, if it is not owned. And uh, on ground, the employees did not get salary or got part salary. The landlord did not get rent or agree for a lower rent. The electricity bills were not paid and deferred. And so people, in a way, survived with their own uh, means. And now when, you know, in a way economy is coming back and things are coming back and businesses are restarting. Uh, again, typically these are the businesses which uh, bounce back the fastest and that's what we are seeing. Uh, the transactions now uh, are even higher than what they were pre-COVID levels, uh, especially on the digital side and things are coming back. Uh, but in terms of uh, benefits, um, still uh, a lot has to uh, reach there. Thank you. Uh, Naveen, if I can come to you, uh, you know, one of the greatest challenges at the moment is that how do you do credit analysis? Uh, what probably worked uh, prior to March 2020 uh, probably doesn't work now it can be in terms of sector and can be in terms of business. How do you go about analyzing a business, a sector at the moment now? Uh, Naveen, you're on mute. Thanks for the question. And, you know, like Sangram and Manish spoke about the two spectrums, right? So typically what Sangram touched upon, what has changed uh, post-COVID or during COVID were the interventions that um, I think the government did. Uh, if I look at uh, the, you know, emergency credit line guarantee scheme, that has worked beautifully well in talking to the entire MSME space, including the micro as well as up to the small. Uh, that has worked well, and I think a lot of banks have taken advantage of that. 
but that is an entity that has been uh, kind of uh, being underwritten and therefore the credit reports are being taken on that specific entity. But in micro and below, the one which Manish spoke about, uh, which is that individual director, owner, proprietor, and even below that, he spoke about the street vendor. So SIDBI has a, you know, a, a website, a portal where they are servicing a 10,000 rupee, very, very micro loan. Now over there, the report has to be on the individual. So what we are now working with all our partners may be a microfinance NBFC or a small finance bank or an NBFC or a commercial bank and telling them that now when you are looking at financing the MSME, what we should do is have a comprehensive view, comprehensive view of the individual who's taking a loan and the business, the entity. If there is a way to link the two, you can underwrite the person or that entity with a holistic view. So now that is a big, big change that has happened. These schemes that the government has come in with, with the help of, you know, NABAD or it may be SIDBI, like I spoke about, that is helping to take, uh, you know, uh, it to the, uh, uh, to the end user. Overall, microfinance, if I see as a trend, uh, you know, on the micro space, earlier, say around five years ago, it was a big, big component. And that was mainly being serviced by PSUs. Now, obviously, the medium and the small are also being serviced, but are being serviced by NBFCs and by commercial banks. Even today, the, the micro is being serviced either by the microfinance, uh, NBFC, SFBs, or PSUs. The commercial banks have slowly, slowly started getting into it. I believe there is going to be a big play in rural. As we know, rural is doing uh, you know, better in, uh, uh, in a lot of ways. And there are a lot of MSMEs in the rural. I believe that the reach of the PSUs uh, and the microfinance NBFCs was higher in the rural area. But now we are seeing a lot of interest from commercial banks who are also getting into this place. So all of a sudden, we see that you know, secured and unsecured both are being uh, looked on. Uh, on uh, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, the secured is the lap. At the top of the pyramid, you have equipment financing that happens on secured. But unsecured remains most important. I think there was one report which I read which spoke about almost 28 lakh crores gap. So opportunity is huge. Uh, and I think there are new banks uh, or new, uh, I would say, uh, financial fintech companies coming in trying to service this segment. But there's a lot to be done. And underwriting is going to be a comprehensive <laughs> of both the entity and the individual. And in certain cases where there is alternative data, you know, uh, uh, Manish spoke about uh, uh, a huge spike in payment transactions. Now that can be used as alternative data also. Uh, POS lending, which, you know, Sangram used to run uh, even uh, the credit card business. So the, uh, so lots of things happening. Alternative data coupled with a comprehensive view uh, is what I believe uh, underwriting will be all about. Uh, so Ganesh, we can come to you. Now, Naveen spoke about alternative data. Uh, one of uh, you know the advantages of getting into a system like a GST was that it will lead to a lot of uh, digitization on the end of SMEs, uh, which will then lead to you know be, you know a, a data visibility and credit worthiness. Uh, has that actually happened? Uh, what's happening now? <clears throat> uh, thanks, Pran. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, lot, uh, we have talked about several aspects of MSME lending, I think, from different perspectives. So just to uh, uh, maybe to focus on uh, the alternate data piece you're talking about, I think we, we have a few big shifts happening in the market, right? And uh, COVID has thrown a spanner in the mix, and that is causing some shifts in itself in terms of the nature of demand, nature of data, quality of asset, customer viability, all of those things. But one we have had we have had infrastructural changes that have been happening whether whether it's with the foundation of you know all the digital tools uh, public infrastructure tools whether Aadhaar or UPI so on and so forth and most recently with uh, with open credit enablement the challenge is I think uh, these things take time 
to eventually uh, get rolled out in the market and when upi started no one had a, or when google pay and paytm and phone pay started very few people understood how to even use those things today it's very common place i mean every every corner street person uses it doesn't mean those companies are actually benefiting from it and they're two very different things uh, but uh, but the point is adoption of uh, game changing technology or tools takes time i think we are we are, and 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 to go down the system i think we are having some challenges where we are pushing some of these things down too fast and gst again was uh, gst was obviously not a necessarily a technology or infrastructural change but it was a very fun, fundamental you know ta ta uh, taxation and revenue related call also to simplify the whole system i think uh, somewhere between the uh, between this in, in in the midst of this massive simplification and uh, richness of data drive that is happening um i think uh, the market is being there's too many things that are being thrown at the market to absorb and uh, i don't think any of us talk about that it's almost as if you know in fact if if we look at some of the technology infrastructural things that are being done we almost and by the way i run a global fintech fund so i should be the last guy saying this but we almost behave as if the man on the street completely is waiting for the next you know uh, patch to be uploaded onto the on, onto upi or ai and uh, raring to go and make the changes right i mean people have lives to run and people have businesses to run so i think that is where the gap is but we need patience and hopefully we will not keep making iterations every 3 6 months onto our infrastructure tools so if we don't do that and we have patience all these things take 3 to 5 years to stabilize if we don't do iterations every 3 4 months uh even if we let version 1 or version 1.1.1 1 and 1.2 run for couple of years that's more important so in, if you conceptually talk about it i think we do see a lot of promise where in general the concept of financing and uh, you know has opened up to whether you call it embedded finance whether or whether you call it uh, uh you know with, with the whole idea of lsps which is being floated at lending service you know loan service providers but fundamentally there is a uh, there is a concept of using the context of a relationship to do financing as opposed to just having a transactional relationship or providing lending so we are trying to see more and more whether digital or physical platforms within a context being able to uh, share data share information and make customers who are traditionally not on the map more viable to be able to get lending and uh, i think uh, 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 we are starting to see more and more promise around that whether with some of the newer companies coming up or within our portfolio itself uh, where they are starting to work with lot of such platforms but it's early days so i would say if you if you ask me about the next 5 years of alternate data i think it will be lot more meaningful than the last 5 years we had because uh, frankly we heard we had lot of talk but very little context and substance around it to be underwritten efficiently thanks ganesh it was interesting uh, anup i'll come to you last but uh, you know uh, like ganesh mentioned that you know maybe we are throwing too many things at uh, you know uh, the sector you know you first had you know everyone said banks are the ones who will lend to msme then the nbfc stepped in and you know they did a good job at it uh, now you have the fintech uh, you know space coming up and uh, trying to lend to msme which model do you think works the best is this a combination of all or do you think you know what we have today uh, a lot of fintech companies looking to lend and provide solutions to msmes is that going to be you know uh, the 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 part which works the best uh, thanks uh, pran <clears throat> so look uh, since you have asked a very focused question i'll straight away jump into it and uh, you know i would want to respond to this in a bit different way uh, you know and and uh, let's look at the transport sector for example uh, do you think uh, a train can solve all the problem in terms of transporting goods or a large truck or a small tata is you need a combination of all three right so uh, a train can move goods from point a to point b and and where uh, the train drops the goods at point b the large trucks pick it up and then drop in the small mandis and from the small mandis in the narrow lanes the tata aces take the goods in the same way you know banks nbfcs and fintechs are playing their role so banks are these large institutions you know built over 
a long 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 period of time and and they have this huge balance sheets a huge depositor base from where they are able to sort of mobilize resources and they have been lending this for decades and decades right and then we saw the nbfcs uh, coming up uh, and, and and the last decade was phenomenal for nbfcs they played a fantastic role where banks were not able to reach you know these are the roles played by the large trucks as i was saying and banks played the role of the cranes and then you have the fintechs you know so the uh, you know uh, and and where what's the role of the fintechs say for example these msmes need some flexible products in terms of revolving credit short term credit uh, unsecured loans you know these uh, were not easily available from let's say banks or nbfcs and that's where fintechs collaborated uh with banks and nbfcs and offered these products using different methods either they took the risk on their own balance sheet or uh, you know they they provided guarantees to banks and nbfcs and and uh, got funding from them and that's how they created liquidity and access of uh, uh, you know funding to these msmes so i would you know uh, think like this that it's it's a collaborative approach uh, it's and that is what is working in a win win way Uh, everybody has a role to play banks nbfcs and fintechs what is very interesting is and i want to share this as an example uh, like we had invested in a company in rajasthan uh, about 10 years back and and then you know financial services in rajasthan uh, it, it was not so easily available now we supported one entity which grew so well now we see a lot of other entities have developed around it so it's it's a development of ecosystem uh, finally you know so so that's how one should see it thank you uh bab uh, since we're running out of time uh, i'll quickly come to you know one of the uh, peeves of the msme sector has always been that you know banks just do not lend uh, whenever they go they find it very difficult to you know uh, raise money from banks What are the kind of difficulties bankers face, and uh, uh, how how have you guys responded uh, to the challenges of the pandemic? Sorry, so just to clarify that uh, you're saying in general to the segment MSME segment or yes, yes, some yes, some yes. sub parts yes. of the segment uh, in general. Okay, so in general, I think I, I'm not sure whether I would uh, sort of subscribe to the view that you know banks are not able to lend to MSME segment. I think there's a there's a fairly large balance sheet which have been created to the tune of six, fifteen to sixteen lakh crores, etc., which has been created in this segment, right, across all banks. So so there is. I think the the real challenge has been what Manish was also talking about earlier is that when you start from the medium enterprises and then you go to smaller enterprises and then you further go down to micro enterprises and at some point of time the the distinction between and uh, you know a business and an individual begins to sort of go away and you're looking at uh, lending to an individual. Uh, and those are the cases where. i think you will see lower penetration of bank credit and more penetration coming from nbfcs and then uh, from uh, you know some of the newer uh, fintech lenders and i think it again goes into the uh, it ties into a couple of things one of those is risk appetite right uh, banks typically will have a, a slightly more stringent risk appetite than some of the other lenders and that begins to then sort of reflect in uh, who can be lent and uh, and the other uh, thing which is linked to the risk appetite then becomes the operating expense model um, and the operating expense model typically will try to then uh, push the ticket size higher which again moves to a particular type of customers that banks will want to lend to and slightly different types of customers than bfcs will want to lend to so i think uh, i don't think that there is a there is a design choice issue out here i think it is more about uh, the the current solutions which are there and the current risk appetite uh, actually sits more with certain larger tickets slightly larger businesses when it comes to banks uh, when it comes to nb uh, and also do keep in mind that the rates also move in a in a similar manner right uh, and that's where the risk return equation fits in so there is a particular range of risk return that the banks want to uh, sort of put their capital in there's a slightly different one for nbfcs and a little different one for the uh micro lenders <clears throat> just one little point i want to add on the alternate data that was being discussed 
um as an addition that i i think there's the lot of data is being created uh, but when you when you look at alternate data uh, you also should be clear about what is the outcome that you were looking for uh, whether the outcome was to make uh, better credit decisions better underwriting decisions in which case it was to avoid the type one and type two error of either lending to a customer who should not have been uh, given that amount of debt or uh, i mean that was one error or the other error was you know some good customer was being uh, kept out of the net because of some uh, lack of some data now in in the case of uh, you know uh, using it for the former basically what we are doing is that we are looking at the currently addressed market and seeing you know how data like gst etc can help you make better choices uh, but i think uh, and that's where most of the data has been generated right now especially the gst data because it's it's gone to customers who had at least 40 lakh turnover etc uh, i think most people have been expecting that data to allow people to lend to the very underserved segments right and that is where it it probably will take some time because you know uh, you need various types of data you need uh, repayment data and you need uh, income estimation data so ability to pay and intent to pay both have to sort of reflect in and i think sometimes we sort of uh, we are not very clear about all, what was the outcome that we were looking for from alternate data i think alternate data in likes of gst etc is now being actively used for the traditional lending which is happening it helps you figure out uh, some of the information which was not readily available in either cash flows or balance sheets So I think that information will go well, but like Ganesh was mentioning, I think in the next few years we'll probably start seeing the power of that data to go to the underserved segments as well. Uh, gentlemen, I'm so sorry to interrupt here, uh, but this is all the time we have for today's discussion. Any final thoughts? Uh, I think there was just one uh, audience question that I wanted to take. Uh, if uh, you have two minutes. Yeah, yeah, maybe. please go ahead. Great. Uh, so there was one question which uh, says. Uh, ab says you know given that the activity in the past 6 months for small businesses were very less how do we underwrite them when they do not have any credit score uh, manish do you want to come in how do you you know uh, do come to a decision when 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 faced with a situation like this sure so uh, uh, i think the answer in a way also is in some of the things that my co panelists have been saying that one uh like anup also said there's a role for different type of uh, players here uh whether it's banks and bfcs or fintechs and many fintechs have been working with this alternate data which is a indicator of the credit quality in the absence of credit score 40% of the 5 lakh loans that we ourselves have done have been new to credit there was no score there was no background and if you see again broad data Three years back, when I started my journey in Happy, we used to say there are one billion bank accounts and two hundred million credit bureau records in the country. Today, that number stands at five hundred million uh, credit bureau records and five hundred million still to come into the credit. So, is bureau the only way to take decision? It is not. There are plenty of data points available. Many successful, innovative uh, uh, models have been built to give credit to this segment and. Ganesh also said, uh, as I said, you know, my co-panelists have already highlighted many of these things. Uh, there, uh, maybe between the mega trend which was happening in the country even before pandemic, that digitization was going up, and from a secure lending model that banks were running, people were developing models to do unsecured cash flow analysis based lending. Maybe this pandemic has been a tipping point. and many of these models which have developed now on looking at the customer payment data transaction data alternate data uh, there are many billing softwares which are going out there there are many physical uh, models going out there they will are the ones who will now start making more sense and to facilitate credit flow into this segment ron if i can just join in over here oh, yeah yeah uh, so uh, where like you know it's new to credit and they don't have a bureau score uh invoicing data other than the gst data which was spoken about right invoicing data no one has spoken about psychometric data psychometric data is available today crif itself has a solution on that maybe an individual or a business either in urban or rural psychometric data could be you know gathered and it is the you know intention to pay that is being looked at income documents will tell you the capability of pay 
the bureau actually told what your history was so you know there are different uh, things that are actually coming out and uh, this is a very interesting space and like i heard the panelists uh, and i agree with them the next 3 to 5 years will uh, actually pinpoint who wants to use what in which segment yeah all right yeah. Uh, thank you so very much uh, gentlemen we couldn't have had a better start to for day 2 of ifta thank you so very much each one of you all for being here now if we were on stage i could have requested for a group photograph but since we are not can i see jazz hands please because next year when we see this <laughs> all right thank you thank you so very much for being here gentlemen. it was fun thank, thank you everyone you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you thanks a lot bye bye